Hello and welcome to the first Parks and Human Services Committee of 2022. All right, our first order of business is roll call. Chairs Andrea Michelle. Here. Council Member Satwinder Carr. Here. Council Member Tony Trotner. I am here. Okay, do we have any uh, changes to the agenda for today? Uh, nope, thank you, Madam Chair. There's no changes to the published agenda. Okay, council members, any changes? No. Nope. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Madam Chair, I move to approve the agenda. Second. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, moving on. Our first, oh, we still need to approve the minutes for October 7th, 2021. Are there any discussions, questions, comments? Okay, can I get a motion? Madam Chair, I make motion to approve uh, minutes for October 7th, 2021. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, the minutes are approved. Okay, our first order of business is the Lunar Lander Mission Control contract for Kursan Park. And we have Terry Youngman up to talk about that. Good evening, Madam Chair, Council Members. Thanks for having me here tonight. Terry Youngman, Park Planning and Development Manager. Uh, I'm here tonight to present to you the uh, Goods and Services Agreement with Northwest Playground in the amount of $300,947.34 for the Lunar Lander and Mission Control interactive play elements. These elements will be installed at Kherson Park as part of the renovation project. And this is obviously subject to terms and conditions acceptable to the parks director and the city attorney. A little bit of uh, history here. You'll recall we've been working on this project for a few years. This uh, graphic that we have up on the screen right now is an overall site plan. Uh, this is more or less at a 90% construction drawings uh, milestone. So we're getting very close to being able to proceed this project Right now, uh, we're showing construction this summer, so very exciting to be moving ahead with this project finally. Uh, where these elements will be located, the ones we are talking about is in the northwest corner. Uh, so you'll see a blue slide uh, kind of facing uh, to the north and east. That is the lunar lander element there. And then just to the north and west of there, there's a green bar that you'll see. That is where the mission control piece. These are companion pieces, so there's a, actually a communication between the two pieces where you know, someone can be at the mission control panel and punching in dials and buttons and can actually talk to someone who's inside of the lunar lander. So it's kind of a cool interactive piece. So that's why these two pieces are, are coupled together. The fabrication then is coupled together. You know, the reason why we are going with this uh, partnership between Northwest Playground and Create Play is uh, partially because the original elements, the lunar rover and the astronaut were both fabricated by the same company. These people specialize in custom play pieces. This is all that they do. Uh, they're a very much a reputable company and it's been a great experience working with them. Part of the reason we are here today is to request a, a waiver to the competitive bid requirements. This is the exact same thing that we did in order to acquire the Lunar Rover replica. So same scenario, it's basically the same paperwork that's signed by the mayor that will be coupled with this item as it goes to council and it essentially waives that competitive bid requirement. The rest of the project will all go through a competitive bid process as we would for any construction project. So all the other elements that you see within uh, the, the site plan here uh, would be competitively bid as a construction project. Um, I think if you can go to the next um, tab there on the Adobe, I just wanted to show you some of the images, kind of fun to look at here. So this is the lunar lander element. This is inside of the lunar lander element. Um, you can actually come in from a hatch on the bottom and then there's a climber that gets you to the top. If you wanna go to the, to the next one on this, you can actually just, uh, oh, thank you. Perfect. So here's a shot of the lunar lander itself from the backside, ladder going up and inside to the piece of equipment. We've put a lot of thought into how this is being designed. Um, so you'll see some perforated panels and windows that, inside of it so parents can see their kids playing inside of it. They don't just go inside and disappear. Uh, that's really important to us that there's good visibility um, and also so that you can't, nobody's hiding out in there. So that was some, some thought that was put into this piece. This is actually really close to how the actual lunar lander looks in real life, which was really important to us because 
the overall theme of the park is very much on the realism side. You know, you kind of have the spectrum of very playful, kind of cartoony, and the realism. We're leaning more towards the realism to kind of give this sense of, you know, history and storytelling of, of what Kent's role has been in the space industry. Um, so kind of going to some of these other images. This is just another view from the side here. And then here you can see the slide element coming off the front side of it. And there's a little springboard element right there that will give kind of a, a sense of bouncing on the moon as you're coming off of that, that piece there. And then Ron, if you want to take us to that next tab. Thank you, sir. This is the mission control piece. Uh, this was that green bar that you saw up in the northwest corner. Uh, a lot of interactive elements that are part of this piece. Um, very similar to the lunar rover, if you've seen that piece, it has buttons and nodes that give you a tactile response when you push them, so it gives you the sensation of pushing a button. It'll also give you a, a, a response that you'll hear as well in the, in the visual cue of the light coming on. Some of them are static, so we didn't want to make it too many button buttons and replaceable parts. We tried to get a balance of things that you know, needed to be replaced versus not replaced. Uh, there's also some games built into this element too. You'll see the, the buttons, the red buttons on the dash. That's actually going to be the game Simon. If you remember the game Simon where there's a pattern that pops up and you're supposed to repeat the pattern. So there's kind of some interactive, uh, more children focused games that are built into this. It's not just intended to be a perfect replica of it, obviously. Uh, and then what's not shown here is actually on the back side of there where you see the blank green panels. We saw that as needing to have some activation in a future versions of this plan that will go to construction. There's actually uh, some interactive play elements that are built into the back side of that wall as well, just to add some interest there as well and use up that space. Um, let me see here. Yeah, this is more technical stuff. We don't need to get into that. So I just wanted to kind of show some of the images of what's actually going to be built. The idea is these will be built by Create Play. They'll be shipped here, and then they'll be installed by the contractor when we bid that construction project. That, I think, is everything I had to present. Um, if I'm having to answer any questions yet. Um, Terry, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. This is really super exciting. I'm glad to see that this project is moving forward. Um, for the lunar lander, is, can adults fit inside of there? No, it's really going to be pretty tight. You know, the, the footprint, OK, so the site itself is very small. Uh, I, know, I know. I want to get inside of it, too. Uh, so we had to size the playground appropriately. It's, it's actually relatively small. I think really only three or four kids are going to be able to be in there at a time. That's why we have many different elements, is so that there's not just one thing that's the draw. So you know, we've got the lunar lander, the mission control, the lunar rover, the astronaut. There's other things in the park, too. But yeah, it's not going to be big enough. I mean, I think you could, but it would be pretty tight. And then for the control, is that undercover or is that all like weather proof? It's going to be exposed to the elements, but it's designed to be exposed to the elements the same way that the lunar rover was designed to be. So all of the electronic controls are watertight. It's not like you're going to get water inside and it's going to break. Um, you know, it's not completely vandal proof. Things happen, but we have ordered a set of replacement parts that come with the fabrication of the piece so that we'll be ready to replace them if something were to happen. Great. Does anyone else have any questions? Just a comment, Madam Chair. I am so excited to see this park and these pieces. And just like Council Member Michelle, Council Madam Chair mentioned, uh, I would love to play in that. <laughs> but I'm sure my kids will by that time. So uh, super excited to try out. So, um, and I'm excited that it's actually happening. So thank you. Yeah, thank thanks. you for you all the work. You have to just settle for a ride on the lunar rover. I think everybody can fit on that piece, but yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Troutner, do you have any comments? I don't, Madam Chair. I would just be happy to put forward a motion. Okay. We're ready. All right. I move to authorize the mayor to sign a goods and service agreement with Northwest Playground Equipment in the amount of $300,947,034 for interactive replicas of a lunar lander module and a mission control console to be installed during the Curzon Park renovation project, subject to the terms and conditions acceptable to the park's director and city attorney. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Thank you. All right, up next we have Pete Peterson talking about golf cart use agreement at the Riverbend Golf Course. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to present the Riverbend Golf Complex 
golf cart use agreement and financing lease agreement. Uh, I'm Pete Peterson, I'm the manager of the golf course. And every four years we go out for a bid or an RFP for new golf carts. And this current agreement is for a four year term, 32 payments with $83,319.32 annually and a total term of $333,277.29 over the four year term. Uh, the golf complex, we average about 15,000 cart rentals a year. So it's, and that revenue, that, that cart rental produces about $200,000 in revenue annually. Our fleet consists of 36 electric carts, 36 gas powered carts, two gas powered Marshall carts, two standard maintenance of utility vehicles, and one range picker. Um, and the question has come up in the past, how come we don't have all electrics? We'd love to have all electrics, but currently we're at our capacity for the electrical ability to charge carts. So somewhere down the road, uh, we, we'd love to be able to expand to have all of our carts electric. And a little bit about the golf carts. Uh, the electric carts come with a lithium battery with a five-year maintenance-free warranty on them. And this is gonna reduce our charging costs about 50% and will produce an annual savings of about $7,500 a year compared to our current fleet. The gas carts are equipped with a low emission, highly fuel efficient engine, which is gonna save us about 30% compared to our, our current fleet. And likewise, the maintenance vehicles also have the same gas engine as the, as the gas carts. And we're looking at somewhere of a annual savings of about $10,800 a year compared to our current fleet. Any questions? Um, I'm just wondering, how does this price compare to previous contracts? This, this is about $2,000 a month more than what we were currently paying, but our old lease is about five years old, going on five years old. So staying with the, the increase in, in cart prices over the last couple of years and moving to a lithium battery, that adds a substantial amount to the price of those carts. But reducing the maintenance costs to where we don't have to add water to those batteries every month and replace them after so many hours, it'll be a big savings over the life of the carts. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, can I get a motion? Chair, I move to authorize the mayor to sign all necessary documents to lease 72 golf carts and three maintenance carts for, from Pacific Golf and Turf, LLC, through the Huntington National Bank for a four-year term that will commence upon the date the equipment is received by the city and the bank remits payment to Pacific Golf and Turf, subject to final terms and conditions acceptable to the parks director and city attorney. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Okay, up next we have a facilities recap and work plan info from Will Moore. All right, let me test, all right. Good evening, Madam Chair, Council Members. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Will Moore, and I'm the facility superintendent. Um, so tonight, I'll be going through the 2021 accomplishments and what to expect coming up this year. So a big project uh, that's actually underway before I came in was the corrections plumbing upgrades. Um, and as I understand it, the this has always been a big maintenance task and causing a lot of work orders for our team. Um, there's leaks on a regular basis from the hot water circulation line and we upgrade that to PEX, which is a lot more corrosion resistant. You don't get the, the turbulation in the lines that causes the pinhole leaks. Um, we upgrade the toilet valves because they're very old and failing on a regular basis and requiring many service calls. Uh, to this day, corrections is, is probably one of our bigger maintenance issues at that building. And uh, this upgrade really helped with the service calls as regards to the toilets. Uh, the cell fixtures, 
went from porcelain to stainless steel, as you can imagine, porcelain and vandalism in the corrections facilities, so this was a big upgrade. Um, in addition to that, the waste lines went from, uh, we upgraded the new waste lines for the new fixtures, the stainless steel fixtures, resloped them for proper drainage, and as well as some of the cast iron has started to crack over the years. And as you can see in the picture, uh, it's just an example of a new cast iron line right there. Um, this was a big one that we completed, installed many shutoff valves for the correction staff, so they actually have a list now at the jail so that the corrections officers know where to go isolate if someone's causing an issue and it could actually one of the bigger feedbacks that we've had of, of that upgrade. Um, and then the new floor drains were added to the booking area for flood control as you can imagine clogging and causing issues in the lobby. So these were some really good upgrades and the staff there was actually you know we've received a lot of feedback not only on the decrease in service calls but also being able to maintain these by stocking these parts and having more availability as well. Um, second big project, the uh, Riverbend Driving Range. Um, this is actually, if you haven't been there yet, it looks amazing. The new expansion to that, I think, has made a huge difference. Every time I go there, it's packed. Um, they added a new office space for the staff in the open concept lobby with a new pro shop area. Added 13 new stalls. Uh, has a new ballroom with a state-of-the-art ball blower. So the team there is much more efficient. They pick up the balls and it shoots them down to the ball machine now uh, instead of having to manually do it. There's all new lighting throughout the whole facility inside and actually on top of the range at night now is really nice new spotlights that light up the place. They're working with Top Golf to install Top Tracer, which is an expected project this year that should probably drive a lot more revenue for them as well. Uh, the Pro Shop, like I said, it was expanded. Uh, tons of good merchandise in there if you've been by there. There's new restrooms for the patrons. Uh, takeout, cor sorry, takeout counter for the food and beverage. And uh, I know it says expected tenant is half line, but happy to say that they're actually there operating. And People, you can have popcorn, hot dogs, drinks, and it's actually really nice. And a new rooftop unit, which is for air conditioning and heat, has been added. Uh, roofing projects, we were able to complete the police headquarters, corrections annex, and East Hill Operations Center. Uh, these were needed projects, obviously, with this week. Uh, it's made a big difference. Neely Soames and the Kent Historical Museum, we conducted Actually, including the painting, it was a power washing of the roofs and a full exterior paint job at both of those. The Kent Museum actually required a lot of lead abatement just because of how old it was, so that actually been, was a more substantial project. Um, and it actually required a lot of coordination with the Greater Kent Historical Society along with the King County Landmarks Commission to make sure that the paint job was approved and the colors were of historical significance. And actually, it went back to almost the original color, um, which was pretty cool. And it turned out really nice. And Neely Soames, um, same thing, power washed the roof and a brand new paint job on the outside, in addition to a lot of carpentry repairs to make sure that that house is in good condition moving forward. Uh, this is a big project that I'm sure you're aware of and that is currently underway with the facilities condition assessment as well as master plan. Uh, we've completed the, all the site visits for the facilities. Uh, there's an energy and financial analysis in progress. There's an operational plan in progress and the master plan is in progress and we're targeting a completion of Q2 of this year. And so more information will, will be presented uh, as we move along in this. And that image there on the left is just an example of the energy analysis and what they've found so far. And uh, I'll be presenting more details as we move along in this. Uh, City Hall second floor patio waterproofing. Uh, it's just right up above us here, actually. Uh, this was a solved a long-term issue of leaks down into the lobby here at City Hall. And happy to say, I, since I've been here, I haven't seen a leak. So it's, it was a successful project. Kent Commons, we had to replace the racquetball court, one of four of the racquetball courts due to water damage uh, from the closure of COVID. Um, and it's a full new 
floor installed in October of 2021, so it's really nice up there. And we'll be refinishing the other floors coming up, so it's, it'll all be nice new surfaces. Will, can I ask a question? How was the floor damaged because it was closed? They think that it was an HVAC-related issue where since we had shut down completely, potentially the room, it actually... It's hard to say. We had we had dissected an area, and they said it may have been moisture or just too dry, but the boards started to just separate from each other, and there were seams. And we tried to repair it, and it just kept coming back, and it was right in the middle where the red lines are, and it was impacting the play. So we had to replace the floor. The, they did this forensic wood analysis on it, and they determined that it, it just needed to be replaced. Um, so LED lighting retrofits, this is an ongoing project, but as you can see, there's a long list of locations that we continue to convert to LED instead of replacing a, a light bulb that's out, that maybe a fluorescent light that's out, we move forward and make sure we upgrade it to an LED. Um, and this is something we'll continue to do and really have a big focus on making sure we're energy efficient and not just something's broken, replace it like for like, but upgrade it to an LED. Um, some additional no items to note, um, we seal and recoated and restriped the Kent Senior Center. I don't know if you saw it before, but it was basically black asphalt, and now it's a really nice new parking lot with nice lines, and it's made a big difference for, for that facility. Uh, we renewed the Siemens contract for our HVAC controls, which is, in my point of view, this is one of our most critical systems that we can see the status of all our HVAC equipment throughout the city on a computer. Um, so it allows the HVAC team, myself, to manage the systems really well and adjust temperatures, see what's going on. So it's very important. Uh, renewed the PAC power contract for the generator testing and repairs. Renewed the Smith Fire contract for fire monitoring and repairs. I wanted to highlight some in-house projects that the maintenance team had completed. The City Hall IT Annex training room, the city shops pass-through window, and four office cubicle reconfigurations throughout the city. Uh, some HVAC highlights included upgrading the half-line walk-in freezer, new exhaust fans for the police headquarters. We did that at the same time as the roof because it just made sense. And we installed two new split systems for the impound yard. All right, so 2022, here's some projects and items to look forward to. So police headquarters renovation and the detective's tenant improvement. So the police headquarters is going to include the new training room, relocate the men's locker room to upstairs to make room for the training room, a really nice new lunch room, break room, and an outdoor training meeting space. Uh, we're actually expected to break ground on that at the end of this month. We just had the pre-com meeting on Tuesday, and they sent us the schedule today. So more information and communication will be coming very soon about that. Um, detectives, tenant improvement, uh, is the same story. We have a, we're a little bit delayed on that just due to furniture lead times right now. Um, initially, they were telling us four to six months to receive furniture, which I, I know everybody's heard that story now. So we're ready to go construction-wise. It's just a matter of the furniture and completing that project. Access control upgrades, uh, so the badging system. We are planning to add card readers to Senior Center, Kent Commons, and the golf course because those three facilities don't actually have that system yet. And in addition to that, we need to continue to upgrade and maintain our existing system. It requires this pro watch on the back end that requires software maintenance and upgrades, as well as continuing to upgrade some of the readers out there that are at the end of life. Um, in collaboration with IT, we're actually looking to upgrade the key card type for increased security and functionality, which should include dual authentication, which I think a lot of us are familiar with now and having to provide a secondary uh, login or <clears throat> text to your phone, if, for example, or even up to biometrics, eye scanning, fingerprints, stuff like that for future need. Um, we're targeting Q3 again. This is one that's majorly impacted by these supply chain delays just because it's the electronics and we actually are trying to get our hands on a sample device currently that's been taking us a long time. 
Uh, the senior center roof is slated for Q3, sort of tail end of summer where we still have the good weather. It's currently in design phase right now. Um, we are conducting, this is something actually I'm excited about, is we're conducting a feasibility study to determine if installing solar panels there as part of this project makes sense and is we get the right sunlight there and we get good overall ROI on that, which uh, we've hired a consultant for and we expect to see the report and, and look into that further as well because it it, it's a great location, a lot of visibility, big roof, and so it might be a good opportunity. Uh, new CMMS system, which is, to simplify that, it's our work order system where uh, anybody in the city, department liaisons, submit work orders for a broken window, for example. Uh, we currently have web TMA, which you see there on the bottom. It's very outdated and antiquated. It needs to be upgraded to a new, more, more modern system. Um, working through this currently with IT, uh, but it will create much greater analytics for us, life cycle budgeting. It'll be an asset database loaded into there. Um, in addition to mobile access for our maintenance employees where they can check in and out of jobs, track costs. We can see how much time we spent on a particular boiler over its lifespan. So it'll provide us a lot, much, a lot more information that we need. Uh, security camera. Systems for City Hall and Centennial Center. This is actually already underway. The cameras are installed. I don't know if anybody's noticed them yet, but they're in those locations where the, the yellow stars are. Um, so you, they're there, but again, the hardware, the back end server for it is ordered, but we're waiting for it to arrive to connect everything and get that back online. And that will be part of the existing security camera system that we have throughout the city. So just increased security for City Hall campus. Kent Commons renovation. So phase one of this we've determined to be the gym portion where we're going to refinish the floor with new striping and logos. If you can believe it, that floor has never been sanded and refinished in, since it's been installed. So it has a lot of layers of finish on it. So we're, once this is done, it's going to be a beautiful new floor. Uh, we're going to be able to put the exact lines that we want on it instead of a cluttered floor. It's going to look really nice and clean. Um, and then in addition to that, looking to upgrade the wood slats around the perimeter of that gym and paint paint the gym. So the end of that phase one, we're expecting to walk in there and see a brand new shining gym. And that's really the most used space in that in that whole facility. Um, and then phase two is part of this year. We're going to start planning and design for, for other areas as well. The City Hall campus, the IT annex renovation, um, converting the vaults into a new conference room, new carpet throughout. Three new offices will be built for managers, and it will be a full reconfiguration to support the IT organization. And IT service window will move over there from upstairs in, in City Hall. Uh, the contract is signed with the architects, so design is in progress. We've determined and worked with IT, the best layout for them and scope of work, and we're expecting to complete that Q2 to Q4. Just depending, again, this is going to, there'll be new furniture here as well, and again, the furniture is a big question mark still. So. Uh, courthouse and corrections generator installed. They currently only have a generator for corrections and courthouse does not have a generator. So we're installing one to serve both locations and in addition to this it will free up space for IT in the IT closet at courthouse to serve corrections and expand their capacity for their security camera system and upgrades that Commander McCusen has in in progress already and she's working through. Um, we just met with the engineers, the architect has the plan down and we're expecting this to break around Q2, Q3 uh, and be completed this year. It's a big win for for both IT and, and corrections. So some additional items to note coming up this year, we have life cycle, this is a lot of life cycle projects. Um, as you can see, we have a big slate of parking lot uh, seal coats and restriping. 
Uh, Centennial Center, we need to fix and upgrade the fall restraint system for window cleaning. The City Hall elevator modernizations is a big item to, that we're, we're working through currently. Uh, Centennial Center exterior envelope resealing, which includes cleaning and resealing the entire exterior of that building. It needs to happen on a life cycle schedule. Uh, Senior Activity Center is getting a new coffee bar renovation. The parking garage enhancements, some of those items will include the stairwells and upgraded lighting for safety in that garage. East Hill Operations Center, we're continuing to work through and work with internally parks and even public works to determine best next steps up at that site. The corrections walk-in refrigerator is going to be upgraded to reach end of life cycle. Uh, signage upgrades throughout the city. So Senior Activity Center, we actually just installed a new sign. I don't know if anybody's noticed that. On the side of the building, uh, city shops will be upgrading that exterior sign, driving range, and others. Um, and for me, this is just a bigger initiative overall is to standardize and replace a lot of these age signs you see throughout all the city buildings and come up with an overall uh, program that is upgraded and gives a better look to the city overall. Um, in HVAC upgrades, we have uh, a lot of life cycle projects that will be underway this year into next year and the following years, but this will be a main focus. Um, a good example is actually for the, the corrections project, we have to add a split system to the IT closet over there to support more IT equipment, which is separate from the generator, but it kind of is a domino effect in needing to add that. Police department, chillers, uh, commons upgrading that chiller are some examples. In addition to that, some approved projects from the 2022 budget will include a capital manager, capital projects manager to help us with all these projects. Uh, that's that's underway and recruiting for that. The law office tenant improvement, working with uh, Pat and his team to to build out new offices for them and it, it, basically their space needs and what they have staffing wise. Uh, the print shop upgrades down here in City Hall, Chambers meeting room move and upgrade for multimedia. There's plans in place uh, for that to help the multimedia team. Customer service and permit center renovation is a longer term project. This year we'll likely be planning and design and figuring out the scope of work and then really getting after that project in the coming years to, to renovate Centennial Center down there on the first floor. Um, and then City Hall improvements overall, like I said, there's, there's many items including the elevators here, some of the roofing, the gutters, there's a boiler and there's a lot of different items throughout City Hall that will continue to upgrade. All right, thank you. And any questions? Wow, that's a lot of stuff, Will. Thank you so much for your presentation. I did notice the sign at the Senior Center okay. and it looks good. Yeah. 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 And I haven't noticed any leaking in the out there. <laughs> um, oh, it looks like Council Member Troutner has a question or comment. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I just want to say this is an amazing presentation. I always enjoy looking back at 2021 to see all the things you've done, but I have to say, I think you guys are really going to be busy in 2022, and it's great to see all of these projects that we have coming forward. So thank you so much, and it sounds like you need to get to work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I agree. Any comments? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Will. Um, amazing to see lots of accomplishments, and I know we have a lot of work to do. And I'm looking forward to the master plan coming up soon. So, um, um, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Seriously, we used to have buckets in in this area, right outside the chambers. Yeah, it was um, amazing. So I haven't seen those buckets for a while. It yeah. could be COVID, but hey, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for fixing yeah, that. <laughs> and I'm new, so uh, shout out to the, the team that's been here, Nate Harper and those guys for, they're the ones that really, Tony and them that I stepped in. I don't, I wasn't even involved, but they, they've done a lot of good work and set us up, so thanks. All right, thank you so much, Will. You're welcome. All right.
right. Up next, we have a director's report, and we have Julie Paris Candola. Thank you again, Julie Paris Candola, Parks Director. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council Members. And I forgot to say Happy New Year. So Happy New Year to y'all. I do have just a quick update to share, and it's really just for information only. We've got an item going to Operations Committee uh, probably towards the end of first quarter, but it directly involves parks. It's just a budget issue, so I want to make sure that you're all aware, you know all the details, and if you have any questions between now and then, be happy to answer them. So I'm going to give you some, you know, I'm going to blather on here a bit with some background so you've got all the facts and then give, get into the gist of what we're doing. So I think uh, everybody knows that the Parks Department, really due to the unique functions and services that we offer, as well as the seasonality of our work, because a lot of our work, you know, compounds in the summer and then tails off, you know, on those corner months, we have a high, high reliance on our part-time temporary staff. And to give you a perspective, on average, in a normal year, not a COVID year, but in a normal year, the entire department hires around 350 part-time temporary staff. The Parks Department hires more people than anybody in the city because of that reason. The majority of that number comes from the Recreation Division and all their programs that they're running over the summer, then Park Operations, and then, of course, our golf course. And then also to clarify, of those 350-ish part-time staff, they're not all working 40 hours. I mean, some are working 10 or 20, because we have multiple shift coverage. You know, park operates between dawn to dusk. The golf course is open 360 days a year. And then, of course, all the complicated programs, events, and uh, sports we're offering. Hiring has always been a challenge. I want to make that clear. It's not just now. Uh, it's always been a challenge to try and find that kind of level of staff, especially at a quality level. It's even worse now. I think we're hearing across the nation uh, all the challenges. You've heard it. It is real. Um, if we can't hire the temporary staff that we need, we are really going to struggle. We're going to have to reduce services and parks. We're going to potentially have to close a day or two at the golf course. And then, of course, with recreation programs, with all the kids and things that we work with in different types of populations, we have to have, you know, staff to participant ratios. So we could have to cover uh, closed programs and things like that. And so it's a lot. I think a perfect example last year is the lifeguards. I mean, we and that's still a struggle. We're working on it. Had a great meeting with the Y. I'll do that update later. But that's a perfect example of we could not get staff. So uh, currently, right now, there's a team of us in the Parks Department that is going to be working and uh, with HR to really work through a very aggressive 22 kind of outreach and engagement whole platform to do the best we can, which I'll share more uh, later when I have that more uh, kind of finalized. The item that's going to be going to the Operations and Public Safety Committee is specifically around the Teamsters temporary staff, which directly supports park operations and maintenance. Okay, so it's just that particular division. To give a little bit more context around that, so to meet our current level of service of opening and closing our gates, you know, we have gates in our parks, opening, cleaning, and closing our restrooms, and then managing garbage in our parks averages, we need around 23,000 temp hours a year. That equates to maybe about 25 to 30 temporary staff members, you know, on a certain shift. At about $20 an hour, we can afford about 22,000 hours. The challenge is for every dollar we go up in wage, we lose 1,000 hours if we can't backfill that budget, which has typically been the case, um, and so on. And so the challenge is, if you look at that compounded, we just keep dropping down and dropping down and dropping down because we aren't getting the backfill of the finances to keep it up. Recruitment is getting more and more challenging. We get less applicants than we used to. Uh, we're definitely losing good applicants to Public Works, to King County and other companies. I think you've seen how much Amazon is paying these days. Uh, we're having applicants not even accept job offers. They leave even after a short time after we've already put them all the way through. Um, you know, while HR puts out the original recruitment for temp staff, um, when it comes to hiring, it's a responsibility of park staff to review applicants, interview, get background checks, driving abstracts, onboard train uniforms. It's a huge process only to have staff quit three weeks later. So it's a, it's a burden. Overtime, um, you know, we frequently have to use overtime to fill holes in our staffing schedules uh, created by the lack of our part-time staff. So a lot of people here are very hearing about how police are in mandatory shift overtimes. Parks has been that way for probably three, four years straight. We just don't 
talk about it as much and so on. So it's really uh, very cost prohibitive and not efficient or effective in any way because when we pay overtime, we're paying almost three or four times the cost of, of lower skilled labor than we should and that is just not effective for us. Um, Park operations, we have around 4,000 hours-ish overtime a year is kind of where it is, and we've exceeded our budget every single year. Um, we've also seen a trend of full-time staff that normally pick up overtime shifts declining. Uh, this is really just a result because our, our staff has families now and things are happening on the weekend where in the past, you know, they were single and whatever and they had free time. So because um, overtime is by seniority, it keeps going down the line, most of the overtime falls to two or three staff members who are new and they're the ones getting stuck all this time trying to do overtime. We have a lot of um, understaffing and turnover part-time which actually has a lot of chaos to the overtime to the uh, career staff because it should be way more smooth but we have to keep figuring out what's happening. Puts a lot of pressure on them you know they have to constantly retrain staff that are coming on into effective things. Um, the other challenge it really poses for us is trying to create a work environment and a culture in park operations but staff aren't staying long enough for us to even trust or get to know or anything like that and so it's just a constant kind of revolving door which is a real challenge. The other challenge it puts on us is our succession. You know, historically part-time staff have really been our hiring pool. So if you have a less qualified, less stable part-time staff, when we have career staff opportunities, that means our applicant pool is just not that great because the whole point is our part-time grow into career positions, right? But that has not been the case because they just simply just don't stay. The other thing to consider too is um, job performance and expectations of part-time staff as well when it comes to kind of wage comparison. So our part-time staff almost always work alone uh, on evenings and weekends. They're spread out over 34 square miles. They're very visible, obviously, in our park system and have a direct connection to the people they serve. They are definitely confronted with situations in parks and uh, confronting people about park rules and that kind of stuff. They really do have to choose the right ethical thing to do while they're on site and not just leave things for career staff and so on. And so they really don't have the luxury of working side by side career staff. They're trained and we send them on their way. Not ideal. And so if we're getting kind of less qualified applicants, it puts almost everything at risk you know, while we're out there. We did do a wage comparison in the market. Uh, the majority of all of our peers are paying $20 an hour or more for uh, part-time for this particular maintenance function. We also, unfortunately, are competing with our own city. And that's a challenge, uh, you know, with temp wages and public works being significantly higher than the parks department for the exact same job. So all that background, <laughs> just give you a little bit of nitty gritty, uh, to share over the past couple of months, Brian, Levin, Brian Levenhagen, uh, Parks Deputy Director, and Dave Brock, the Public Works Deputy Director, along with Garen and a few others, key kind of staff members, have really been working together to establish what is the dollar amount that we should both be using for equity, as well as we can't keep raising one and not the other, and then we have this kind of mess we're dealing with, and so how do we work towards future practice that if there's wage adjustments, we do it together, it goes through the process, all that type of stuff. So we've done that now. Um, so a good example is in 2021, Public Works paid an average of $20 to $23, that's kind of their range, and Parks paid 14 to 19. So we're talking almost a $3 difference. So when an applicant comes and they're like, ooh, what job do I want? Well, we're not gonna, you know, we try to shout the value and mission of parks because it's kind of fun to work in parks, but $3 is a hard one to, to get over or a little bit more than that. So, and that's really, honestly, Public Works has a little bit different of a funding source and we have general fund constraints and, you know, a lot of reduction in our budget. And so when we're reducing as much as we are, it's very hard to then jump our part-time wage. Um, so throughout this effort, we are now recommending and shifting to a, a range of $20.80 to $23.80, so that kind of range, so $20 to $23 an hour for 2022. Public Works already has that in their budget. They kind of already planned for that. It's always us kind of tagging along. And Parks is seeking a one-time uh, increase in our budget to get us equal with our partners across the hall and equity across the city. 
Unfortunately, uh, straight out this work, we just didn't get it completed in time when we went through the 2022 budget adjustment process. And if we wait and do it in the 23-24, we've, we've already lost it. And so it's, it's critical we have to address now if we can, uh, because we can't hold, especially the way that the job market is right now, it kind of is compounding that pressure on us right now. So we've shared all that, worked it all the way through on the back end. We did get tentative approval uh, by the mayor's office subject to council approval to increase the park operations part-time budget one time for eight, by 85,000. That will get us equal with, pu with public works. It's again, a one time, it's not something you would do every year, you know, and then what we'll do, we have equal budgets, then it would just rise with regular, you know, inflation from then forward. So we're kind of getting ourselves up to where we should be. Because it is a budget issue, even though it's related to parks, it has to go to par it has to go to operations and public safety committee. And Paula believes that she's going to do that during the first quarter budget adjustment process, probably towards the end of first quarter is kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, and then of course it'll roll to council for final approval. So I just wanted you all to be aware of the big lengthy background and all the details, so that way when it does come to you, you're not like, you know ah what what's happening and so on. And uh, apologize for all the long-winded information. It's just a complex tackling thing we're trying to do. Happy to answer any questions now, or even if you know the next month or so you, something comes up, happy to answer that as well. Thank you for all that background, Julie. Um, my question is about recreation wages then. Is there any reason we're not looking at those as well? Uh, yeah, probably because of the volume and the size of the recreation department. Like I said, they're the majority of it. Recreation does grow already uh, philosophically as minimum wages grow and they have a range. We don't necessarily compete against our own city because they're unique in their function. However, uh, myself and Lori Hogan, the recreation superintendent, are going to be looking at this as something to talk about in the 23-24. We have some reduced, and it is going to be a challenge because, you know, we've already seen in career part-time or in career recruitments, which we're hoping the class and comp is going to address, um, Auburn hires, you know, almost 10,000 higher than what we're paying our career staff. So part-time staff is similar. So in recreation's case, we're not competing against the city, we're competing against the surrounding cities in that case. And so what Lori and I are gonna really try to do is look at, we almost have consistent years of declining uh, part-time applicants. And so how do we look at maybe a conversion if it's applicable, more aggressive and wage increases, but that's gonna be a way bigger ask than we can manage right now, which is why we need to go through the regular 23-24. So we're gonna try and hobble along the best we can. I might be coming back on the lifeguard issue. That might be one that we might wanna trump and do something similar, but uh, we definitely are gonna be addressing recreation in 23-24. Perfect, sounds great. Um, Council Member Choutner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Julie, I just wanna say thank you for sharing this information. Um, I definitely think it gives us an idea of what we have to look forward to, the challenges that you're facing, and mm -hmm. when you bring information to us, um, we definitely have that for background. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Council Member Kaur? Just a quick question. This impacts the general fund, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I would assume Paula will explain where all that, you know, she figured out where that's coming from. It might even come from our own year-end savings of 21. I'm not exactly sure because we're, we're, we're giving back a significant chunk of unspent money in 21. So it's possible it's coming from there. Thank you. Appreciate that information. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any other questions or comments for Julie? Nope. And that's nope. all I have. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. That concludes our meeting. Meeting is adjourned.